estamos perante uh, um investigador uh, que nos trouxe uh, ao, ao fim e ao cabo uh, uma proposta de mudança de paradigma <coughs> através de uh, uma uh, investigação profunda com suporte na ciência, na intertextualidade, uh, etnografia, arqueologia, uma pessoa que uh, elegeu uh, Portugal uh, para desenvolver as bases da sua teoria, que na prática apontam para uh, Portugal e Galiza como, digamos, o ponto e radiador a partir do qual se desenvolveu uh, a cultura celta. Não é? uh, a Luísa faz, faz a apresentação. Hum. Ora bem, é o meu privilégio apresentar uh, o professor John Dickos, como já referiu o, hum. o professor Joaquim, é um, um, um especialista, digamos, que, em estudos celtas, que muitos de nós vimos seguindo tudo, muitos de nós que nos, nos interessamos pela cultura celta e pela filosofia celta e pela religião celta, um, vimos seguindo os, os trabalhos dele já há vários, vários anos. Uh, houve, uma, houve, houve comunicações anteriores em que se falou num determinado paradigma para, para se considerar os estudos celtas, um paradigma que teria vigorado até aos anos 80, justamente o professor John T. Koch e outros investigadores que têm trabalhado com ele e em mesmo com ele e que têm, têm publicações conjuntas com ele, um, aportaram uma nova perspectiva que uh, é, uma, é uma mudança de, para, de paradigma que revolucionam hum. completamente uh, os estudos, os, os estudos celtas. Uh, e então é o meu grande privilégio uh, passar a palavra ao, ao professor John Ticotes. Uh, o título da sua, da, da sua conferência hum. resume, digamos assim, o trabalho uh, dos últimos anos, e vou até dizer o trabalho de uma vida, Uh, intitula-se então a, a palestra que nós vamos ouvir The Arrival of Emergence of Celtic in the Iberian Peninsula in the Light of Recent Discoveries traduzindo a chegada ou, estou aqui vão ver que é muito importante ou a emergência uh, oh. do, do, da Celtia ou do Celticismo ou dos Celtas uh, à Península Ibérica à luz das descobertas mais recentes hum. I give to you, my dear professor, John T. Koch. Um, well, muito obrigado. Uh, can you see this? Uh, yes, professor. Right, okay. Are you seeing uh, the, uh, the, the screen? Yes. You don't, see... need, you, you don't need to see me. You need to see the slide. Can you see the... Uh... Yes, perfectly, Professor. We are okay. seeing and listening very well. Good, good. All right. So the arrival or emergence of uh, Celtic in the Iberian Peninsula in the light of recent uh, discoveries. This is something I've uh, worried about for many, uh, many years. And I've, I've published things uh, about this. Uh, you don't have, it's not important whether you've, you've seen any of this or not. This is sort of my own uh, thinking here has evolved uh, since the time that the last of these uh, books was published. And uh, that's because rapid discoveries uh, and uh, new research has been uh, taking place uh, since Celtic from the West 3 uh, came out in, uh, well, I wrote it in 2015, my part of it, uh, and since it, since it uh, was written and came out. Uh, the, um, what I'm going to try to cover tonight uh, uh, with you is um, new discoveries and theoretical advances that have happened in about the past 10 years or so, and that that have to do with uh, how uh, we decide is most likely for how Celtic either arrived in the Iberian Peninsula, I mean the Celtic uh, uh, languages, or how they emerged uh, in the Iberian Peninsula. And there have been advances in the area of linguistics, which I'll try to cover tonight, 
also in archaeogenetics, and this has been really a revolutionary change, that we can now sequence full genomes of ancient DNA uh, and can see how people were moving uh, around uh, Europe and the even the wider world than that uh, in prehistoric times now, uh, and uh, archaeology as well. And then finally, uh, we'll uh, come to an updated sort of working hypothesis for how uh, Celtic uh, comes into the Iberian Peninsula, either arrives or evolves into Celtic uh, there. And uh, it's not definitive because all of these areas are still uh, progressing very rapidly. And uh, so, uh, as they say uh, in, in the English speaking world, watch this space. Uh, it will change uh, in the future as it has changed in the past uh, 10 years because all of these areas are rapidly uh, advancing. Now, uh, starting out with the linguistic area, I had uh, written uh, uh, occupied a lot of my time with the language of the southwestern inscriptions, uh, which are early Iron Age inscriptions. There's 90 to 100 of them, mostly from southern Portugal, uh, Algarve uh, and uh, uh, the lower Alentejo, but also um, uh, also going into about another 10 of them in southwestern uh, Spain as well. Um, um, in 2015, after I had uh, been working in the field for a while, uh, this book appeared uh, by the American linguist who died two years ago, uh, uh, almost exactly two years ago, um, Terence Kaufman, Notes on the Decipherment of Tartessian as Celtic. As Celtic. Uh, the, the book on the, uh, on the next to it uh, by me, and that's that's free. That's on the internet. It's an, uh, a digital uh, book. You don't have to buy it uh, or order it. Uh, it's just there on the internet. Uh, is largely a response uh, to Kaufman, but to other work that had happened uh, in in recent years, trying to put together where people uh, agreed, various uh, researchers agreed about uh, aspect the Celtic aspects of the southwestern or Tartessian inscriptions, and. There are these five important areas uh, which, where I think Kaufman helped solidify our understanding uh, of the problem of the uh, these early Iron Age inscriptions uh, from the southwestern Iberian Peninsula. Uh, first of all, he confirmed something that I'd thought possible before, namely that um, the Tartessian writing system was adapted from the Phoenician system. Everybody knew that. Uh, there was no big dispute about an early form of the Phoenician writing system, one that goes back almost 3,000 years. Uh, and then, but the key point is uh, where Kaufman changed uh, the, the standard, or my understanding of it uh, somewhat, is to say that it was probably first adapted for a non-Indo-European language, that the alphabet uh, was taken over from the Phoenicians and, and then changed to write a language that was more like Basque or Iberian. And Basque and Iberian, we don't know if they're closely related or not, but they do have very similar sound systems. So they, they're typologically uh, similar and to write them uh, we would need symbols for the same set of sounds because they have sort of a, uh, the ancient form of Basque uh, and the Iberian language spoken in, uh, in Catalonia, the Basque language around the Bay of Biscay and the, uh, and the Western Pyrenees uh, in its ancient form. Uh, those two had a similar sound system. So the, uh, the earliest form, the Paleo-Hispanic script, was taken over, adapted from the Phoenician script to write a language like that, then it was moved to the west of the peninsula and used to write an Indo-European. And I think, uh, and Kaufman thought, and uh, Eric Hamp, who was a famous li uh, American linguist who also worked with Kaufman on the book, they all thought this, we all agreed it was a Celtic uh, language. Um, and in other words, it's uh, it was a script, a writing system that wasn't well adapted to the language it was used to write. Now, once we understand that, uh, the implication of that is that the Celtic 
of the Southwestern inscriptions is not very different from the other ancient Celtic languages. It is very close to the first Celtic there was when Celtic first um, uh, uh, evolved from Indo-European. If you do not understand uh, that the writing system was really uh, devised to write a different kind of language, you would have to assume that a number of changes happened between uh, uh, between Proto-Celtic and the Tartessian language. Now that would imply, for linguists, that would imply that there had been in, in, significant changes that happened. But for historians, that also has the implication that time must have gone by, that Proto-Celtic must be earlier than the Tartessian inscriptions, which means you sort of have to push it back into uh, in, well into the Bronze Age or maybe to the Campana form to the Beaker uh, period, but I don't think that is necessary. You don't need to go back much before the early Iron Age. So I think the late Bronze Age is quite possibly where Indo-European first evolved into into Celtic, and we see uh, what is probably the earliest written Celtic language in a state that is very close to the, the common ancestor, the foundation of all of the Celtic languages uh, in the southwestern inscriptions uh, of southern Portugal and southwest Spain. Now, another area in linguistics uh, that uh, I've I've worked on uh, since uh, the, the published uh, work on Celtic in the Iberian Peninsula is uh, this body of words that are common to the Celtic and Germanic languages. And these are early words I've, I've taken out. I'm not looking at the long words from the historical period. There are a lot of uh, words that were borrowed between Celtic and Germanic one way or the other, Celtic to Germanic or Germanic to Celtic in uh, the historical times, in uh, the post-Roman migration period, the Viking period, and even later. But we, for the most part, those words are obvious, and I'm not dealing with those. So in again, this is a free book. Uh, you can uh, don't have to buy it. It's on the internet. Uh, you have the the code, the URL code down here, uh, or you can search for it on the internet. Uh, it's There are 176 of these words, these in old inherited words shared by Celtic and Germanic, but no other Indo-European language. Now, how that is relevant to uh, how Celtic gets into the Iberian Peninsula is that those words, uh, show a state of the languages that the, the Indo-European, that the dialects that became Celtic and became Germanic were still very close to Proto-Indo-European at the time that the two were interacting with each other. But the other, these words are not in the other Indo-European languages. Therefore, we have a, a situation in Northern and Western Europe where Indo-European has not yet turned into Germanic in the north and Celtic in the west uh, of, of Europe. So we have this, this stage of in the Bronze Age, uh, it must extend into the Bronze Age, where uh, the, uh, Kel what the, the dialects of Indo-European that are going to become Celtic and the dialects of Indo-European that are going to become Germanic are still effectively closer to Indo-European. They're closer to the parent language than they are to the later languages. Well, when was this? Um, oh, let me, uh, just one more slide. The thing, um, let me go back for a moment. Uh, the thing in Germanic that shows that they are still closer to Indo-European uh, than Celtic is that these 176 words uh, belong to a period before the Germanic consonants changed, what is called Grimm's Law had not happened yet. In Celtic, most of the sound changes hadn't happened yet. And these include the diagno diagnostically or even iconically Celtic loss of Indo-European P. This hadn't happened yet. So I've just, from the 176 words, here are eight words that happen to begin with uh, P in Indo-European. And uh, just to take, I'm not going to go through all eight of them, uh, but the third of these is the word for floor uh, in uh, uh, in Germanic. Uh, we uh, in English we have the old Germanic word, uh, and it's uh, lar in Old Irish. Flower is the word today we uh, use every day in Welsh, uh, meaning a floor, and it's it had a p in the original form. So this is this is changed according to Grimm's law. The p has become an f in Germanic, and according to 
the German, uh, the Celtic sound changes, the P has just disappeared. So in other words, that change hadn't happened yet. The, when these, these shared words happened before Indo-European had become Celtic in the West and had become Germanic in the North. So there's this stage uh, that is uh, where these two are in common, yet they do not share these words with the other Indo-European languages. So they are particularly Germanic and Celtic are particularly close in ways that Sanskrit, Greek, and even Latin, though though Italic shares some of these, uh, some words with Celtic and Germanic, but they're even not necessarily closer in terms of the way they turn out, but they have a stage where they are in close contact and have not yet turned into Celtic and Germanic. And in terms of when this was, uh, a lot of these words refer to things in the, that belong to the Bronze Age. And we can particularly put them together with uh, representations in the rock art uh, of Scandinavia and the, um, um, uh, and the Iberian warrior uh, Stelae uh, in, in Portugal and Spain. And for example, uh, one of the subject areas that a lot of these words belong to are referring to uh, horses and chariots and different types of wheeled vehicles and so on. So you can take what I've done here on the screen is this is an image of a, a, a Bronze Age uh, a rock art image of a chariot shown in the standard way of representation and some of the words that are shared by Celtic and Germanic referring to different parts uh, of the vehicle as a whole, as a wagnos, uh, we can reconstruct as a common Celtic and Germanic uh, word for this, uh, and uh, axle. There's two extra words for horse that they have. They inherit the Indo-European equos for horse, uh, but they have two extra words uh, that Germanic and Celtic and the other have, but the other Indo-European languages don't have. Uh, they have uh, extra words for axle, wheel, and so on. Plus, the representation here's here's a fuller list of those words that have to do with horses and chariots that are shared by Celtic and Germanic. And shifting from language to artwork, the uh, the the images that you have on the um, on the uh, in the middle of the screen are from Sweden, and those on the right hand side are from. Spain from the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, there's about 30 images of, of uh, chariots uh, in the Iberian warrior uh, stelae. Uh, they go mostly in the south, but what there's one has been found in Galicia uh, recently. So they go as far north as, as Galicia and they all look very, very similar to the Scandinavian ones. You could take, if you were to take one of the Swedish ones and put it onto an Iberian Stella or vice versa, take a, a, a chariot from an Iberian Stella and put it in Sweden, nobody would notice that it was out of place because they're represented in the same way. The horses are turned around so you see them from the side, even though you're looking at the chariot from the top. Uh, similarly, the wheels are turned out from the side. You have in the both the Spanish one and the Swedish one, uh, the pole that goes from the chariot to the yoke uh, of the chariot is represented as three lines. It's represented as three lines, both in Sweden and Spain. Uh, you have this curve uh, around the a double curving line representing the body of the chariot. The horses are turned out 90 degrees facing each other uh, towards, the, uh, towards the center of this. This has to be direct contact. These people have seen how, they've seen the same way of representing a chariot. This is not the abstract idea of a chariot represented separately, independently. And they're about the same date. So we're dealing with, you know, maybe 1300 BC to 800 BC is when all of these images uh, are, are made. Another uh, area in which you have common Celtic and Germanic vocabulary, old and inherited vocabulary that is very relevant to how they're in contact with each other in prehistory is boats and sailing and, and rowing of, of ships and vessels. So that you have a common Celtic and Germanic word uh, for a boat or the hull of a boat, for a mast, for a sail, for the crew of a boat, for rowing, for the activity of a rowing, and again, you can go from the, the linguistic part of this to the archeological part of this, and you see 
that the images are very similar. So this one is on the over here is from Galicia. This is from Sweden. They both show the mast, the rigging, the crew in a very similar way. And here are some more of the words that they have in common. There's a word for harbor, a shipload, uh, and a great waterway is in common. So there's a big list of common maritime words, and then the images of ships uh, and boats are very similar. This one is, I think this is Northern Portugal. They're nearly mostly coastal, these, these uh, rock art images, which show it's faint here, but you can see it is similar to the way this with uh, a ship with Roman uh, but rowing oars. And here with the uh, paddlers or, or men with oars, in this case, the oars are upright. This is from Sweden, and this one is also from Sweden. This is from uh, northern, I think, northern coastal uh, Portugal. Again, so far as we can tell, about the same period. Uh, these are late, late Bronze Age uh, rock art images. Um, now, uh, going uh, now to the uh, the archaeogenetic part of this from the linguistics, so from on from the first heading to the second heading here. The big revolutionary thing that has uh, been turned up uh, on relevant to linguistics and relevant to uh, Celtic and the other Indo-European languages and how they reached uh, their homes in Europe is uh, that they found that there was a, a large population movement coming from what is now Ukraine and South Russia about 5,000 years ago. Now, there was already a good theory about Indo-European, the Indo-European languages spreading from the same Pontic Caspian steppe area, Ukraine, Southwest Russia, about 5,000 years ago, but they had not expected that there'd be this huge evidence for a large population movement coming at the same time, spreading into, it went into Central Asia, if you can see my arrow here, into uh, Central Siberia, uh, and but it also went heavily into Northern Europe and then later into Western Europe, but not a lot later. It was a rapid movement. So by 2500 BC, so 4,500 years ago, uh, this movement of people from the steppe we can see in their ancient genomes had reached the Iberian Peninsula. They had also reached Britain and Ireland, and they transformed the population in all of those places along the Atlantic facade. Uh, they reached France a little earlier than that. Uh, we don't have as much evidence from France as we would like, but it fits into this picture as well. But by 2500, 2400 BC, they had reached uh, the, these people coming from the steppe or with ancestry, whose ancestors had been in South Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, in the present day, had reached the Atlantic facade by 4,500 years ago. Um, oops, going wrong way. Right. Now, this is uh, from this article, uh, scientific article by uh, Inigo Olalde and uh, a long list of collaborators uh, uh, about uh, the transformations of the Iberian uh, genome, the, the genetic uh, makeup, the gene pool of the Iberian Peninsula in prehistory. And what uh, to interpret this here to help you understand what we're looking at here, these are the Y chromosomes, the male ancestry. This is the chromosome that only men have, uh, as opposed to the autosomal DNA that, that uh, both men and women have, or the X chromosome that women have two and men have one. This is the Y that only Y chromosome that only one has. And up to 2500 BC, the Neolithic and Copper Age people of the Iberian Peninsula had these kinds of these blue and uh, green Y chromosomes, a, a particular kind of Y chromosome that had nothing to do with the people coming from Ukraine and South Russia, nothing to do with steppe ancestry. Then shortly after 2500 BC, the men start, men from ancestors on the steppe, they start to arrive in the Iberian Peninsula. By 1900 BC, they had completely replaced the, the uh, male ancestry of the Neolithic from Iberia. Now, the other chromosomes are still there. So it looks like 
uh, men, mostly it was men who were coming in who had this steppe ancestry. The women, uh, the, there is still persistence of Neolithic chromosomes and uh, uh, X chromosomes and the other chromosomes. In fact, most of the genome is from the Neolithic ancestry, but it looks like the men came in and then over the next four or 500 years, they were very successful in having uh, children these men with step ancestry and also successful in one way or another preventing men who didn't have step ancestry from having children and over about the course of uh, 20 generations or so the the neolithic male uh, y chromosome had completely disappeared from Iberia. This is not quite the same as what happened in Britain and Ireland, where it looks like there was more thorough replacement of the population, that both men and women were involved. And it's possible that there had been a plague before that, and that they were moving into a more or less empty uh, uh, empty countries uh, at that time. That's one of the theories, but it's a different, uh, in both cases, it transformed the earlier population but in Britain and Ireland, it looks like both men and women were involved in the in the transformation. Now, the interesting thing about this this chart here is that when you go to the map of the pre evidence for pre-Roman languages in the Iberian Peninsula, there's this this is Unterman's map that I've uh, updated somewhat. Uh, beyond this line here, so on the Mediterranean or Pyrenees side of it there is evidence for non-Indo-European languages, languages like Iberian and Basque and possibly other ones as well uh, in the south. Uh, on the other side, in the center of the peninsula, this is where the Celtiberians were, and then the Atlantic facing part of the peninsula, uh, you have uh, evidence for Indo-European languages, mostly Celtic. So these Briga names, uh, which are on the map, uh, contain a Celtic word. We still have the word in Welsh. It means a hill or a hill fort. Uh, it's Bray now in Welsh. But uh, at any rate, uh, it's uh, uh, a very sharp uh, contrast between Indo-European, mostly Celtic evidence on this side of the line, and then on this side, the Mediterranean side of the line, uh, mostly non-Indo-European languages. But on this chart we just looked at, this change of the Y chromosome, the step ancestry coming in uh, on the male side uh, of the genome, this happens all over the peninsula. Even down here, even in the uh, uh, Iberian speaking areas where you have little or no Celtic evidence, uh, that change happened. So the ling linguistic uh, uh, change is not quite the same as the, uh, as the uh, genetic change that is going on. Uh, you need both the genes and I think a connection with other Indo-European speaking places. And in this case, if you look at the map, it looks like that connection is by the Atlantic because the side of the peninsula that faces the Mediterranean and the side of the peninsula that faces the Pyrenees and Gaul, uh, that you do not have this strong evidence for Celtic languages. It's the, it's the, uh, it's the side that is facing the Atlantic that is uh, where you seem to have uh, the evidence for the, the difference uh, together with the genetic uh, step ancestry uh, that is allowing the Indo-European languages to flourish there. Um, and in this respect, something similar is going on at the other end of the Indo-European world, where again, it looks like you have mostly men came in. There's this Marina Silva et al article that you can look at that will explain that. Um, uh, and um, uh, in this case, it reached all parts of South Asia, uh, the steppe ancestry, mostly men, again, like what happened in Iberia, uh, and also like what happened in Iberia, uh, it didn't completely eliminate the pre-Indo-European languages. So there's still Dravidian spoken in South India, uh, but the steppe DNA on the male side has predominated even in, even in the non-Indo-European uh, speaking parts of it. So very uh, similar at the other opposite end of the Indo-European world. And again, where the Indo-European languages prevailed, it is connected, it is the part that is connected to other Indo-European speaking areas uh, in Iran and Central Asia and so on. 
whereas the uh, area that's farther away from those, uh, it was probably uh, just easier to speak the women's language, the language of your uh, mother and uh, uh, and your wife and their ancestors, uh, rather than speaking the father's language, uh, because there was no uh, close connection with people speaking the same language. Right. So uh, another new big uh, article uh, important on uh, ancient DNA is that of... Um, uh, Nick Patterson et al., again, a big list of 100 collaborators uh, writing this together, which appeared about two years ago, uh, early 2022. Mostly, like the, the, uh, the title says here, the focus is on Britain uh, and a change that happened in the population in the middle to late Bronze Age, uh, so about 1300 to 800 BC. That's a period that's going to going to keep coming up here. But in the article, not uh, highlighted in the headline, uh, there's also a lot of emphasis, uh, important findings about things happening in the Iberian Peninsula at the same time. So first of all, what happens in Southern Britain is new population is coming in at that time, about 50% changeover, they say, is happening in what's now England. And um, they, the earmark or the, the main sign of this, this change in population is that the Neolithic ancestry, the early European farmer or EEF, as they call it, ancestry, uh, comes up from 31% to about 38%. So a moderate rise, but it's uh, nonetheless significant. Uh, and there's, they're clearly coming in from the outside and not uh, sort of native uh, Neolithic people, old uh, uh, people with farmer ancestry, uh, starting to have more children. Uh, they they clearly look like they're not uh, they're not the the native British Neolithic people. Uh, at the same time, the step component falls a little bit in England. At the same time, in the Iberian Peninsula, exactly the opposite happens. The step ancestry, more people are coming in, but the step ancestry goes up. And the uh, the Neolithic ancestry, remember, they'd already placed the Y chromosome, but this is the rest of the ge genome. Uh, the old Neolithic ancestry goes down at the same time. Now, so between Britain and, um, and the Iberian Peninsula, therefore, what's happening in the Bronze Age is that they're coming nearer to the same levels of steppe ancestry and Neolithic ancestry. They're coming to be more, so it's looking like they're coming more into balance. Uh, the balance between uh, uh, Neolithic and steppe ancestry is becoming more similar uh, during the Middle and Late Bronze Age. Uh, we don't know where these people are coming from. They could be coming from Central Europe, from the Ehrenfield area. They could be coming from France, a little bit farther to the West, uh, or they could be, it could be a process of uh, the north-south moving up and down the Atlantic fringe, that they're coming from Ireland and Britain down towards Iberia and vice versa. Uh, we, at this point, we don't know. We probably will know. It could be a combination of those things, that people are just on the move in the late Bronze Age uh, and moving across different areas of Europe. What we now know probably didn't happen is that this didn't happen these arrows might be going in the right direction, but the date is wrong, that this is not happening in the Iron Age, uh, that the, what the Patterson et al. article is showing is that the population in Britain looks like it was very stable in the Iron Age, so between 800 and the Roman period, and it also looks like it was isolated. Uh, the changes were happening internally in their genetics that were not shared with the continent until the Roman period. So... Uh, this standard idea that the Celts expanded in the Hallstatt and Laten Iron Age periods uh, and reached uh, the Atlantic facade at that time, that doesn't look like it's likely to be correct at all, because you'd need to have languages moving with very few people moving. Whereas in the late Bronze Age or the Beaker period, going back to the beginning of the Bronze Age, we have lots of evidence for people moving, and it's likely they're speaking Indo-European languages, which Celtic is one of those. Uh, now, another thing where research has really um, 
made a lot of advances uh, in recent years is finding where the metal is coming from in the Bronze Age. Uh, so we know, for example, that Scandinavia has a very rich Bronze Age, uh, lots of uh, artifacts, weapons, jewelry, tools made out of bronze. But surprisingly, they found out that they aren't using, uh, there is some copper in Scandinavia, they weren't using it. It's all coming from somewhere else. Well, where is that somewhere else? Well, it turns out in the period about 1700, 1700 to 1300 BC, a lot of it was coming from Wales, which is interesting uh, if you're in Wales in, in particular. Uh, and uh, so that was a surprise. A lot of it is coming from this uh, Great Horn Mine or Penagogart, it is in Welsh, uh, and uh, which is this prominence uh, full of copper, uh, that you can see from far out in the sea. Uh, it's on the coast in North Wales near the town of Slandidno. Now, at 1300 BC, that stopped almost completely. The mining at Great Orm stopped. And you see in this chart here, at that point, it's continental sources, they say. Well, that's very broad. Uh, it's just not in Britain or Ireland. Well, where are those continental sources? This is one thing, a project I'm involved with now is this Maritime Encounters project, which is funded by the S Swedish Central Bank. And we have, uh, we're involved with excavations taking place down, down here. And it turns out that we're getting chemical matches and you know, isotopic matches for the copper in Scandinavia uh, from mines in uh, the southwestern Iberian Peninsula. Uh, places like um, Las Manillas, uh, that seems to be a huge productive copper mine. Chinflon, which is near the open cast Rio Tinto, they're still producing copper down there. That, for whatever reason, Great Orm and the other mines of Britain and Ireland, there is copper in Britain and Ireland, went out of production. And uh, it's massive amounts of copper between about, it's again, the same dates as the Patterson et, et al. article, about 1300 to 800 BC, massive amounts of copper seem to be coming uh, from uh, the Iberian Peninsula, uh, north, uh, north into, as far as Scandinavia, uh, and here's an, an example of another find that uh, has been uh, the, the these are there are ten shields from Froslunda here in uh, Sweden. Uh, the copper that has been sampled, and it is pointing towards a site down here in uh, in southern Spain. So somehow, and I think it's more likely by sea than getting dragging it all the way over land. Uh, they are bringing metal a huge distance. Uh, from uh, southwestern Iberia to uh, Sweden uh, in the late Bronze Age. Now, another uh, important link in this and, and uh, this conjecture that it is being moved by sea uh, rather than overland is reinforced by this other recent study where a mass of uh, copper and tin and bronze artifacts, that's bronze is the alloy of copper and tin, uh, were found in the water in a natural harbor at a place called Salcombe in southwest uh, England, uh, dating again, almost we getting the same date span over, uh, over and over again, 1300 BC to 800 BC. Uh, it, it, they probably, there's either multiple shipwrecks or they have been depositing uh, the uh, maybe making ritual offerings of the metal artifacts and ingots uh, to perhaps giving uh, uh, offering to the gods for a safe journey or thanking the gods for a safe journey. But at any rate, uh, they have now tested again about two years ago, uh, this Berger, Daniel Berger et al. article in Journal of Archaeological Science is um, uh, has tested the sources of these uh, Salcom artifacts. And again, they're coming, it looks like they're coming from down here. That is where the metal is, is coming from. Now, as well as the story of the chemistry of the metal, uh, showing us where it's coming from and where the, the cultural contacts over the seas are in the late Bronze Age, we also have the typology of the artifacts and for example, 
six of the tested objects in the Salcom find are swords of the distinctive Ross Nowen type. The, um, the site for which these swords are named is in Western Brittany, near Brest, uh, and they are found in Southern Britain across Northern France. They have very, very distinctive shape. They have a rectangular hilt with four rivets, a long straight blade. Well, down here in Portugal and Foyuge, uh, we have uh, a warrior Stella showing a very, very clear representation of a raw snow and sword. So again, we we putting these different kinds of evidence together, we've got um, um, uh, metal moving uh, from the Iberian Peninsula north into the North Atlantic. And then we have uh, ideas uh, moving throughout this area, throughout the network, uh, having to do with ships, with chariots, with weapons, with heroes. And this shield is very similar with its concentric circles. This is shown from the back where the hand grip is, uh, very similar to those Frostlunda uh, shields, uh, which are over here in, in Sweden. But it's down represented down here, one of many of the shields of this type represented in uh, the warrior Stella, the Iberian Peninsula. We have examples of this also in, in Ireland. The actual shields have been found. Um, now, returning to the, the Patterson uh, article uh, for a bit here, uh, as I said, they don't really know where these people who are coming into Britain were coming from, uh, but of the different places they've None of them are an exact match, but they've tried to match to other ancient samples. They had a number of them for France, all of which are kind of too late because they're Iron Age samples. Uh, so they could have received population from the same place that entered uh, Britain. These two are from in Kent, so they're already in Britain. So that really doesn't, the fact they're close matches doesn't really solve the problem. It shows that maybe this is where the, the new population is landing in southeastern Britain, uh, which is a sort of natural assumption, but they could have been coming from anywhere. It's kind of a natural place. It's the narrowest part of the channel. It's kind of a natural place to come in. But one of them is from uh, an Iberian site. And in some respects, none of them match perfectly, but in some respects, it, it's uh, helpful in that it, um, it allows a smaller proportion of new people to come in uh, to affect the change of uh, uh, the ratio of step to Neolithic DNA. But at any rate, this is an interesting site and the, the where that genome, that so-called Tartessian genome is coming from is from Alcala del, del Rio, which is, on a navigable river here. These white dots are warrior stelae, so it's right in the middle of their distribution. It is actually the nearest place to a, a um, navigable river to the Bronze Age copper mines. So this is, you know, sort of a very significant that they happen to have one of the, the samples, one of the genomes, well, that's actually two of them from Alcala del, del Rio near Sevilla um, that they used. Uh, that can be used to model the new people coming into Britain in the late Bronze Age, uh, that's significant. Uh, and uh, it, it again, it allows us different kinds of evidence to be converged here, uh, and including linguistic evidence, because Alcala del Rio is actually the site of one of the Tartessian uh, inscriptions. And um, there's a fair amount of agreement that the last word here in the main text, which reads Kashe Dana, is the same word as a Gaulish word, Kasedanos, which means a bronze or, or tin minister. So that, again, we, we sort of can put a lot of different kinds of evidence together here. This is near the copper mines. We've got a word having to do with uh, a social office related to metals and mining uh, in the, er this is the early Iron Age, but probably the language probably goes back to the late Bronze Age at least. Uh, and then it's on a navigable river. Uh, it's near uh, lots of warrior stelae and so on. Uh, warrior stelae that can be related to iconography and ideas uh, further uh, in the Atlantic North. Um, okay, so we are, uh, have come uh, to the end uh, and wouldn't want to go any further tonight, um, which is uh, bringing us, I hope, to um, uh, an attempt to put these 
new facts together and adjust what we, we think we already know uh, and develop sort of a new working hypothesis. Again, I caution this will almost surely have to change <clears throat> because we're getting more evidence in all of these areas uh, and it's coming very rapidly and we're getting much better and bigger evidence because the, uh, the technology is improving that allows us to pinpoint where metals are coming from and we have much more ancient DNA evidence with more uh, fuller genomes and so on. Um, I think the, uh, the archaeogenetic evidence is now in favor of a very rapid expansion of a uh, an Indo proto indo european from uh, the grasslands north of the black sea and caspian sea uh, around about uh, starting around about 5000 years ago the language had not yet broken up into the branches of indo european it was one language that spread very rapidly and then started to diverge uh, into the different languages including uh, including celtic and also Italic, which became Latin, Greek, uh, uh, and Germanic in the North. Uh, these, uh, this uh, expansion of step DNA, which presumably is bringing Proto-Indo-European together with it, reached Iberia, Ireland, and Britain uh, by about 4,500, 4,400 years ago, and it transformed the populations of all those places. And it's likely that it introduced forms of Indo-European speech to all those places. Later on, there was a bit of a lull between about 2000 and 1300 BC. Then there was another uh, set of movements uh, which affected uh, the Atlantic facade <clears throat> in the net effect uh, was that the northern part of the Atlantic facade and the southern part of the Atlantic facade ended up more similar genetically after these middle to late Bronze Age movements. Um, it's not clear where they, uh, where they came from yet. It will be clearer. It could be some combination of these different places. Um, and then um, um, because it now looks like the language of the Tartessian inscriptions has not uh, evolved very far from the common ancestor of the uh, uh, of all of the Celtic languages. Uh, that uh, makes it more likely, with this rapid expansion of Indo-European reaching the Atlantic, uh, reaching the Atlantic facade uh, over four thousand years ago, that Celtic evolved in situ. It expanded first into the west, then it evolved there. Uh, by the the dialects converging uh, when they were in uh, intensified contact uh, during the the metal exchange uh, intensity of the late uh, Bronze Age, uh, rather than having uh, evolved somewhere else and then moved in in the in the Iron Age in the Iberian into the Iberian Peninsula and other parts of the Atlantic facade, uh, that doesn't look very likely now. Um, so I'm saying that. In my view, Iberia was probably part of the zone in which Indo-European evolved into, into Celtic towards the end of the Bronze Age. And uh, uh, finally, uh, well, I think I've said this before, uh, the language of the Tartessian inscriptions is not much evolved uh, from the common ancestor of the Celtic languages. Uh, the, it, P is lost, which means that by definition it's Celtic, uh, and um, um, uh, but it's uh, it's probably has resulted from convergence of uh, uh, Indo-European dialects that had already reached the West rather than moving in. This also it affects how we think about Lusitanian and its relationship to Celtic, because I think it's quite possible that they evolved as sister dialects and neighbors uh, from. Uh, going back from the first arrival of Indo-European uh, in the Iberian Peninsula, and then the ones with with the closest relationship with the other, closest contacts with the other uh, dialects that turned into Celtic, uh, went all the way and became uh, Celtic. Uh, Uto Obrigado. <laughs>